All right, cool. All right, so uh, my name is Sam Taggart. For those who don't know me, I think I know most of you guys. I own a small company called System Automation Solutions. We're based here in Golden. And what we do is we work with LabVIEW architects and developers like you all to help make them more efficient and effective. So we do things like helping them with the test stuff, like I told you, just to show you. Uh, by the way, check out my blog. Uh, I can give you a card later. And uh, I've got all kinds of articles about how to do that. So, um, so yeah, that's what we do. We help them with uh, software engineering best practices, Refactoring, you do testing, dealing with legacy code, doing continuous integration, uh, learning new stuff like DQMH. So if you guys know anybody who would be interested or would benefit from that type of stuff, please send them my way. I would love to uh, sit down and talk to them. So I always like referrals. Uh, today we're going to talk about test-driven development. And I have the word slash design because uh, I gave this presentation at GDEVCon. And I know how many of you people know Fabiola. But she's very opinionated, and we got into a very heated discussion about whether it was testing development or design. She was very adamant it was design, and I said, it's my talk, I'll do whatever I want to make this point on. She made some good points, so uh, we'll talk about that a little bit when we get to that. Um, yeah, I've got all these acronyms behind my name, but it doesn't really matter a whole lot. Uh, so, uh, Fabiola is into this thing, our giants are female, and basically her point was the whole, I think it's Isaac Newton, is that quote? says we stand on the shoulders of giants, which basically means that there are no really new ideas, right? We build on existing ideas. And she seems to think that, and she's probably right, that uh, there's a lot of women who did stuff and we don't recognize them. So she says we giants are female to try to recognize women who have contributed to the science and engineering and all that. And uh, when I went to England for GDEFCON, I happened to uh, go to this museum and they had a thing about the moon. And apparently this lady worked on the uh, software for the Apollo, and I'm guessing those are punch cards, and uh, it's kind of amazing, uh, kind of amazing to think that, uh, you know, we flew to the moon on a processor less powerful than our cell phones, so. and uh, she was a part of it, it is Margaret Hamilton, so I thought that was kind of cool, so I threw that in there. All right, uh, so some of you guys are aware, I know Ben's aware, Peter I mentioned too, so, and uh, Kyle, so, there was this conference in England called GDEVCon. Uh, I don't know, how many people have went to NI Week? Okay, so if you've been to NI Week, you know that sometimes the sessions are hit or miss, there's a lot of marketing, right, a lot of fluff. And so some people got together and they were upset that you know the presentations that they wanted to see at NI Week weren't getting in because they didn't align with NI's marketing messages and all that stuff. And they said, well, you know, for a couple bucks we could throw together our own conference, and so they did. And so they threw together this independent lab geographical conference in England. And it was so successful that they did it again. And I got inspired. Uh, and you guys go to the CLD Summit when we had it? I don't know, Peter, maybe? Yeah. So then I cut that. So I said, well, if they're not going to do anything, we can do this. And so it's a two and a half day conference. And we're going to bring in some big name speakers, Alan, Fab, those type of people are going to be there. So lots of uh, big name speakers, big ideas. Um, there will be some beginner stuff too. And it's kind of geared towards teams. So like, for example, you guys at Lockheed Martin, you know, one of the things they emphasize is trying to get people to bring, like, whole teams of people. Um, so it's, it's, kind of, and it's more on, like, teamwork and how to work together and best practices than it is, like, hey, look at my cool, fancy lab new stuff. So, um, and we're looking for sponsors. If any of you guys uh, know any companies that have money and would like to sponsor us, or if you have a little bit of money, um, you don't need a lot of money to be a sponsor. Uh, we have some low-level stuff for, like, alliance partners. So a couple hundred bucks helps, and uh, you're glad to have it. And you get your logo up on the screen. And so, all right. So that's that. Uh, I do want to advertise a few events. So I got my arm twisted into doing this a little bit last minute, so I'm going to take advantage of it. Uh, so uh, the first one you'll all like, actually. So I'm having a holiday party. And it is the sixth, <coughs> and it's down here in town in Golden. I connect, and it's free, and there's free beer. So who doesn't like free beer? There's also some food. Uh, there's a link there. Uh, I'm also putting on a webinar, so I do uh, a webinar every other month. And uh, December's topic happens to be refactoring, which we'll talk about a little bit today. It's kind of related to test-driven development. And it's free, all you gotta do is sign up. Uh, and then there's a few other things. Uh, so 
there's a group of us, Ben's there, Kyle's there, we get together once a month and we do this little office hours things where we get together and bounce ideas off each other and all that. Um, I want to start something a little bit more formal and more directed, so it's uh, kind of a mastermind group. But basically it's a bunch of people who are really serious about you know, writing code and doing things the right way. And so we'll get together a couple times a month and we'll have some lessons and do some learning, but it's, it's more like, these forums I think are about learning. So you come, you learn some stuff, but then generally you go home and you don't have anybody pushing you to like implement anything and sometimes you forget about it or you don't do it or things like that. And so this is about like trying to push each other to try to write better code. So if you're interested in that, let me know. And then they've got two classes. So the unit testing class is kind of related to what we're talking about today, but it's really more <coughs> in depth. And it's a one day seminar. And then we have a DQMH class. Uh, does anybody know what the DQMH is? It's kind of like the actor framework, but it's not because uh, like actor framework is very heavily class-based and pretty advanced. DQMH is much more approachable. It's basically a way of taking the NIQ message handler template that you see in like LabVIEW Core 2 or Core 3, right? So you, you've got a loop that's running and you've got a queue and you put messages in it and the loop does something. It's a way of basically turning your whole program into a bunch of modules like that and how they all communicate. It's pretty fancy and it's got a lot of stuff done for you, like the stuff about uh, stuff about um, how to send messages back and forth and doing the stopping and making sure everything stops. And, you know, if you've ever done built some kind of your own framework, right, there's a lot of glue that gets the messages around and there's a lot of making sure everything stops and all those bugs are worked out for you. <coughs> so, it's been around for several years, it's been pretty well tested. Fab wrote it, she's pretty dang smart. She knows what she's doing, so. All right, so, and motivation for this presentation. Right, so I talk a lot about unit testing and I always hear this. Writing unit tests when our existing code is too hard. Right, anybody ever feel like that? Anybody who's played around with it, they're like, yeah, this is a pain in the butt, right? There's a reason for that. And I use this analogy, Fab uses this analogy, so I stole it from her, so she must steal it. Say you have a circuit board, right? And make, how many people work with circuit boards or test circuit boards? That, that's what I started out doing in LabVIEW, right? It's a pretty common LabVIEW task. Right, so you hand your circuit board, you've got a bunch of instruments, you hook them up, you take some measurements. What do you do if this chip here, say it's got some signals that you need to measure in order for, for your spec to pass your test, and the signals are on layer five of the board and they never come out? Or they come out underneath this chip? Right, can you test it? Right, it's impossible. So you send the board back and you re-rev it and you design it and you tell them, hey, put some test points in there so I can test the dang thing. Your software is the same way. When you designed it, you weren't thinking about testing it. So the signals that you need to get to, like for example, what's getting written to the serial port, right, and you're inside your driver, it's hidden inside the driver, right? It's like a single hidden inside the interior of the board. So what you gotta do is go back and do what I showed you there with the serial interface and redesign it, okay? So, that's why you're having trouble uh, testing your existing code. Right? And that's why what I'm gonna tell you now is write the test first. That's gonna be kind of the mantra of this uh, thing. Because when you write the test first, you automatically bring all those signals out to where you need them because you know exactly what points you have to test. So, right, retrofitting tests is really hard. And I think a lot of people try unit testing and get discouraged because of that. <clears throat> and learning unit testing is easiest when you have a new project. Right? When you have a new project, you can design it so all the signals and all the points that you need to touch in order to be able to do your tests are available. And writing the test first changes your design. And I'm going to add, if I should add this, it changes it in a good way because it makes your design less coupled and more cohesive. Right? Which means that, so less coupled means that each part of your program, right? We make our program modular, right? Everybody kind of understand the idea of making things modular. So if I make a change over here, it doesn't affect something over here, right? If that's true, if I can make a change over here and it doesn't affect something over here, that means they're loosely coupled. Right? And cohesion means that each module has one text, right? So when you're making your classes or even your sub BIs, right? You don't want to make your sub BI, you know, do A and then B and then C and maybe D, right? If that's the name of your sub BI, it's probably doing too many things, right? You should be able to describe it with one short little phrase, you know? 
set voltage range. That's a good. Not set voltage range and gain and this and that. Right? That's a bad uh, design. It's not a very cohesive thing. And the problem is that BI now has four different reasons to change, right? Four different things in your project or your specs or requirements change, and now you've got four different reasons why that code changes. And you might change it for one reason and break one of the other reasons, which are the problem. Right, so, so by writing the test first, not only does it change your design to make it easier to test, but it makes it better code anyway. So uh, the real inspiration for this was that uh, I asked Nancy, I don't know if you guys know Nancy, what was a good book on unit testing, and she recommended this book. And it doesn't look that bad. And I ordered it off of Amazon, and I got this box like this big, and I picked it up, and it weighed like 20 pounds, because it's a 900-page book. It sucks. Um, if, you, if you need to sleep, go read that book. Um, it has a lot of good information in it. Um, it's not the great intro to unit testing book. But I will tell you what it's really good for. If you ever get to the stage, and if you start writing unit tests, you will get to the stage where you have a lot of unit tests, right? Because every VI, you're testing it for multiple different combinations of inputs, so you could end up with a ton of tests. Eventually, you get enough tests that it gets hard to manage the tests. And so that's kind of what this book is about. So if you ever get to that point where you're like, yeah, you know, I, I wanted to add this one feature, but I had to change 20 tests, you can go read this book and it'll have some patterns and some ideas on how to avoid that. Uh, this is the book that Fab recommends. I have not read it yet. It's sitting on my desk. But I've skimmed through it, and Fab recommends it. And I've read some other stuff by this guy, so uh, I'm sure this is pretty good. And I will shamelessly plug Fab's book, too. She had a book called uh, Graphical Programming that just came out. And it has a chapter on unit testing, too. And it's like, it's thick. It's not 900 pages. It's probably like 500 pages. But uh, it's all lab unit, so. Uh, all right, so, right? If we start a new project, and I, I got this idea from Steve Watts' book. I don't know if anybody's read that. But he's talking about project management and lab view and software engineering. And he says, you know, there's two things we need to know before we start any project. Now he's thinking macro level, but I think this applies as well to unit testing. <coughs> we need to know where we're going, right? What's our goal, right? I'm sure you guys at Lockheed, you guys do your specs at the beginning, right? Requirement specifications, right? You guys are probably pretty big on that. You know? Theoretically. What? Theoretically. Theoretically, okay. well, I know regulated industries are way worse about that than all. other industries tend to ignore that. But um, regulated industries definitely have like a big, huge requirement spec document. And so you need to know where you're going. But the next thing you need to know is how do we know when we get there? Right? How do you know when you're done? How do you know that it actually works? Right? And Steve's case, he's talking about project management, and he does a lot of fixed price projects. So he wants to know when he's done because he wants to have some tests that he can hand to the customer and say, "Hey, look, we said we do this. Here's the test." Now pay me. So we need some way of telling that we're done and that we did what we said we were going to do. And unit testing can actually give us both of these things. So before we write the code, we write a unit test that says, hey, when the inputs are this, this is the output we expect. Right? We've written a specification for the code, right? And if you go through the library classes, right, they give you a specification at the beginning. They say, hey, you're going to write a function that does these things. It's going to have this input, and it's going to generate this output. Right? They write it in text. Here we're writing it in a test. And writing it in a test is way better than writing it in text because we can just run the test. And the code doesn't lie. The code tells you, hey, it did, or in this case, it didn't do what it's supposed to do. So one comment I've heard from Steve is tests li or, uh, comments lie, tests don't. Right? So if you write comments, comments are like aspirational. It's like, I meant to do this. It doesn't actually tell you what it does. The test tells you exactly what it does, because either it passes or fails, and that's it. There's no ambiguity there. And misleading comments are worse than no comments at all sometimes. Yeah. So if you've ever encountered that, you know, you're hunting down a bug, and you're like, well, it can't be there, because the comment says it does X, Y, Z. And then you're like, wait, it actually doesn't. All right, so what is test-driven development or test-driven design? Right? So no matter which of those two flavors you pick, so test-driven development, so Fab calls it test-driven design because you're supposed to think about the test as you're designing it, and I think that's important. But I think you gain a little something just by writing, actually writing the test first, which is why I call it test-driven development. Because as you're developing the code, you're writing the test first. 
And it's really about changing the way you think about things. So often we were like in a hurry to write code, we write a bunch of code, and we're like, oh wait, I gotta test that to see if it works, right? How many, anybody fall into that, right? Come on, both time. Text parsing and stuff, right? And formatting strings for serial ports, right? You write it up, you think you got it right, you put something in, you're like, wait, that's not the answer. And then you go back and you write a test around it, right? And you probably put it inside a BI, and you, you, right? But do you ever save that? Do you ever run it again? Probably not. Right? But if you do, you're already like a step closer to a unit test, right? A unit test is just kind of formalizing that. And so I think this quote right here is really important, right? You, you don't write the <coughs> test to test your code. You write the test so that then you can write the code to meet the test. And it's just flapping those in your head. And uh, once you make that change, it's actually quite, uh, quite mighty. Um, the other thing about this is it's kind of iterative, right? So if you've got, say you've got a serial driver for, for something, right? You decide you need a set voltage. All right, so you write the test for the set voltage range, right? Mm -hmm. Then you write, make sure that passes. Then you move on to the next one, and you say, hey, let me write a test for set current. Set current, right? You write the test. And maybe you don't even write all the tests at once. Maybe you write the test for like the, the normal case, like, hey, everything works. You get that working. And they say, okay, well, maybe I should test if there's an error, what happens? Okay, so I write that test. And then <laughs> you add the code to make sure that it does what you want it to do when you have an error. So it's this like circular thing. I want to say the next slide explains that a little bit. So we start either with no code or with some code that we already have. We decide we're going to write a new feature. And we write a test to test that new feature. And it can be as big or as small a feature as you want. It can be as simple as, hey, I want to make sure that this handles errors correctly. So you write the test, and you run the test to make sure it fails, because you want to make sure you're not getting a false positive, right? So you write the test. Test fails, watch it fail, set it back. <laughs> then you go right and edit your code and you do something to hopefully make the test pass, right? And you run the test again. And this says all tests, right? Because you run all your tests to make sure that well, when I added this thing to do this feature, I didn't break anything else. Right? So that's a, another added value of unit testing is if you have everything unit tested and you run all the unit tests, you're not going to change something over here and accidentally break something somewhere else. And if, it's dull, if something fails somewhere else, well then you go back and you redo your change. You either like, you know, fix what you broke or go back into source code control and revert and try all over again. And then when everything passes, this stuff's also kind of important. And it's so important that I'm doing my whole December webinar on it, and it's called refactoring. And basically what you're doing is you've got something that works, but maybe the way you did it, you can think of a better way to do it, or it's hard to understand, or it's kind of messy or whatever, right? And you want to clean it up. So you go back in there and you make some small changes and start cleaning it up and then you run the test again to make sure you didn't break anything. And then maybe you clean up some more and you run the test again. And eventually get to the point where the code's nice and clean and you're happy and you're proud of it and all your tests pass and then you go and you move on to the next feature. Right? So this step's really important. It's kind of like constant gardening, like cleaning up your house and taking out the garbage, right? Uh, if you don't take out your garbage, it piles up really quick. And pretty soon it gets hard to move around your house, it starts to smell and it's not good. All right, so you might be thinking, well, that's great, Sam. I want to write my test first. I'm going to go plop down all my test stuff. And yeah, what the heck do I drop in here? Because LabVIEW is strictly typed and it needs to know at edit time what the heck I'm calling. How do I, if I don't, if I don't have any methods yet, how the heck do I call anything, right? And <coughs> so, right, that's these boxes here. What do we put in here? And I'll explain what this whole thing is later. We'll see that again, all right? So, in GitLab, uh, actually, so first of all, here's a GitLab repository that has all the stuff that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, you can go look at it, you can check it out, you can check out all the tests. Uh, hopefully everybody knows how to use GitLab. If not, we can talk about that come some of the break. But there's a GitLab repository, has all the uh, stuff, all you need is Git on your computer, you do Git clone, get that, and that'll give you what you want. And I should also note that all the stuff that's here uh, I put it all together and I put it on the LabVIEW Tools Network. So it's on the LabVIEW Tools Network if you want to download the finished product. Uh, that won't give you the test, though. The tests are the GitLab repo. So that's the other thing. When you do unit testing, right? The tests are for development time, and then when you release it, you, the tests are a separate part, and you don't release those in case anybody's wondering about that. So, uh, yeah, here's the GitLab repository. Uh, there's a button here, clone. If you click on that, there's a drop down. It'll tell you what address to use to clone it. Um, and then if you search for TDMS, read, write, anything, or TDMS header, 
uh, you'll find it. They don't have the landing page up yet. I don't know why. It's taking them six weeks, and it's a simple freaking website. Uh, they have all the information, but uh, um, that's one of the reasons people don't put stuff up on the NI Tools Network. All right, uh, how many people are familiar with TDMS files? If you're not, you should be. Uh, if you're writing CSV files, you need to look this up and uh, start doing it. Uh, James McNally did a presentation in Ivy about this, and he goes, he goes through all the reasons. I'm not going to go through them here. But basically, it's a more efficient way to store data. And it lets you store these things called properties. So normally in your file, you have the data for each channel, but maybe you want to capture some other information, right? How many people capture other information besides the data in their files, right? Like serial numbers, right? UUT serial numbers, sensor serial numbers, calibration dates, the operator, all this stuff, right? If you're doing it in CSV files, you end up with this big, huge header. It's kind of a pain. Uh, TDMS has a way to organize this, so you have like file level properties, and then you have groups of channels, and they can have properties, and then you have individual channels can have properties. But reading and writing them is kind of a pain because if they're different data types, you got to write each one by itself, right? So here I have a cluster with three different properties: a boolean, a string, and a numeric. And if I want to write them, I got to know the names of them, and I got to pull them off individually. It's a pain. Right? And if I want to add something to this cluster, I want to add to the cluster, but now I got to expand this, and I got to add another node here, and I got to copy the name and get it right, and not get any typos. And the same thing here for reading them. I got to know the name and what type it is, and then I got to bundle it back in. So, right, for two or three values, no big deal. But if you got something that you it's going to grow over time and you want to scale it, it doesn't scale very well. Imagine if you had like 20 things in there, right, that you want to rewrite. It get to be a mess pretty quickly. So. How many people have used the NGI or read-write anything? They use that, uh, like the JKI. So basically, what it lets you do is they're designed for INI files. So you take a cluster of data and you say, "Hey, write this cluster of data to the INI file," and it takes care of all the formatting and stuff for you. You don't have to worry about it, right? So basically, this is kind of what they look like. This is what you would uh, pull up in context help. And so I decided, "Hey, I'll just do something similar to this." except that instead of writing it to an INI file, I'll put it to the TDMS file headers. And so I came up with an API design that looks like this. Uh, I think it's pretty nice, pretty clean. For writing, you pass in the data to write, which is a cluster. And uh, in LabVIEW 2018 or 19 or whatever, I wrote this in, they came out with this new thing called VIMS, which uh, Ben, I think, did a, pre did you do a presentation on yeah, it? Yeah, so probably a year ago. OK, so yeah, they've been out for a while. Uh, it lets it kind of adapt to type. You know, some of the lab view things like adapt to type. Like, for example, like the array stuff adapts to type. You can write sub VIs that do that now. And so this will adapt to whatever you wire in. And then also, I added this Vim stuff so that you can pass it in a path. So if the file's not open, you pass in a path. But if the file's already open, you can pass in a reference. So that's just for convenience sake. It's nice, it makes things clean. And then, so you pass in the day you want to write, and then you can give it a group or channel name, and it will write to that group or channel. You don't pass anything in, it writes it to the file level. And then this, it, so in the old days, you would have to uh, take the data that comes out, and without the VIM, it would come out as a variant, and then you have to do this typecast and stuff. So the VIM is just nice, it lets you move it in there. So this, wherever you are in here, the data to read, whatever cluster it is, you get the same thing in data out. So it's nice, you don't have to do, you don't have to plug your block diagram with all this typecast, or typecasting or variant data stuff. And, path the and so this cluster, right, so the elements of the cluster, each element, the name of the element is the name of the property, and the data type of the element is the data type of the property. And for the read, uh, whatever values you wire in here are the default values. So you can give each, val each element of the cluster a default value. And if it doesn't get found, then it picks up the default value. So that's useful if, say, you add a field that says operator to your thing, right? In the old one, test files, you want to read with the same thing, and they don't have an operator, you can say, oh, operator is set or not defined or whatever you want it to be. And you won't get an error out. You just get a Boolean out that says, hey, there were some keys missing. It tells you which ones were missing. So you can then do something with that information. So it kind of makes sense to people. <coughs> uh, if you do anything with TDMS files, please do go download this. Don't reinvent the wheel. This isn't that complicated, but it's kind of a pain to get it right. And uh, I did it, and I it's tested. It works. It'd be a real waste to go reinvent the wheel. Go do something cool instead. Um, so, um, 
right? You write your API first, and then you drop that in your tests. Uh, unfortunately, in this case, since I, I made it a bin, there's some stuff that you have to do inside the VI in order to get everything to coerce the right data types and stuff. So I put some stuff in my VI to begin with, just to get that to line up so that I wouldn't get a broken run arrow in the test. So uh, that's what all this stuff is. It's some coercing stuff and types. Don't worry about it too much. Other than that, it's not reading or writing anything from the file right now. All right, so now I've got some VIs that I can drop inside my test. They don't do anything yet, but now I can start writing my test around those shells. And so what do we want to test? Well, the first thing you always want to test is what I call the happy path. And that's just like the way it's normally supposed to be used in 90% of the applications. If you're doing what you expect them to do, this is what will happen. Right? I write some data in, it gets stored in the file, I open the same file, I read it back out, and hey, I get the same data back out. Right? That's like the normal happy path. Uh, other common paths or alternate paths are, well, hey, I write something and then I read it, but hey, the cluster when I read it has a few extra elements, what happens then? Okay, it should take on the default values. And maybe I should get notified that they're missing and they should tell me what they are. Okay, that would be the other common paths. And then maybe some weird corner cases where like, hey, you know, if I pass in something that's really huge, what happens? Or uh, like other little odd scenarios. Uh, if you've got something that deals with numbers, right, and you're doing division, maybe what happens if I divide by zero? What happens if I put in a really huge number or a negative number or a really tiny number, things like that. If it does some range checking, right, maybe check like at the range and above and below a little bit. And then error path. So, you know, if something doesn't go as planned, the file can't be found, what happens? Does it generate an error? Oh, okay, that's good. Okay. Maybe, maybe if it can generate multiple errors, does it generate the error you expect, right? So it makes it easy for you to troubleshoot down the road. So writing the test for the happy path. Um, so these are the tests. So in JKIBI tester, your test, it becomes a class. It's called test case. And then it's got some methods in it that are the actual tests. And they're all just VIs. And they look kind of like this. Uh, I added this little frame here. I know in lab you quote one or two, they teach you that flat sequence frames are bad. I think they're really useful in this one case because it makes it very clear. We've got several steps test. So we've got a setup test that, that's kind of preparing all our inputs to our VI. The exercise makes it very clear what you're testing. Uh, the verify makes it very clear what you're verifying. So, so the, set, the exercise is running the code that you're going to test. The verify is pulling off the values that you got back and comparing them to whatever you expected. And then we have a teardown case uh, if you need it. So in this case, this setup, it's creating a random TDMS file. So that's going to the temp directory and creating a file. It's in the file I.O. pal, it's like under advanced, you don't recognize it. This thing, valid cluster, this just is a sub VI that basically generates a cluster that contains one of every valid data type. So TDMS headers have like a set of data types that they accept, and that just creates a cluster that's got one of every one. So it's got a double, it's got an I32, it's got string path, et cetera. And, all we're, and, and it gives it some values that are non-default values, whatever the, you know, so it just randomly selects something for each of the values. And here I'm writing it to the file, and then here I'm taking a type def that, that has all those things in it, but they're all set to the default value, and I'm reading it back, right? And the reason, and I didn't want these both to have the same value, just so if it didn't find it, you know, I'd make sure that it's not comparing the same thing. And so, and here I'm just saying, okay, the original values that I put in, is, are those equal to the values that I read out of the file? And there's a whole set of assertion methods here inside the JKIBI tester. There's like a pass if true, pass if false, pass if equal, fail if equal, fail if there's an error, all kinds of stuff. Um, in general, I just use the equals one because it's pretty simple and it's easy to figure out what's going on. You don't have to do any mental gymnastics. And it's really good to make your test really simple. Because you don't have anything to test your test, because you don't want to go down that route, or because where you stop, right? So if you make your test really simple, so you don't really want conditionals, you don't want all these branches, you just want straight through tests. And then here in the teardown, we're just deleting the test file, because you don't need any of those test runs. If you really want to see what's in it, you can set a breakpoint before the delete, and then go open up the file and see what's in it. All right, so that's the basics of the test. And in this test case, this is just the object, and it gets passed through 
when it handles all the stuff that it needs to do the reporting when, it, when, the, when the thing runs. And it does some bookkeeping and housekeeping stuff. All right, so I know most of you guys are not into unit testing, but if you're a unit testing purist, you would look at this and you'd say, okay, yeah, that's a test, but it's not a great unit test. So, so anybody see a problem with this test? The goal of unit testing is to pinpoint where the problem is in your code. What does this tell me if this test fails? What part failed? Did it fail because it didn't open the file? Did it fail because it didn't like one of the values? Did it fail because it wrote it correctly but didn't read it correctly, right? I have no way of knowing, right? It's a good high level like integration test. It's like, hey, throw everything at it and check it, but it's not great as a unit test. But I was getting started, I needed some sort of test and I wanted to write a test before I started writing my code. So I used this test and I got started and I added more tests as I went. So the first thing I did though, following the little diagram I showed you, is I verified that the test failed. So I ran this with the, the three eyes I showed you earlier with nothing in them, and of course it failed. Right, no surprise there. And then I wrote some code to uh, basically for the happy path, right, for the test that I had, which is the, the generic use case is, hey, I write a bunch of data, I close the file, I open it again, I read it back, and I get the same data. And so here I took, this is the VI I showed you before, I basically <coughs> dropped a sub VI in here that is this. And basically all it's doing is it's taking the variant in which is a cluster, and it's converting it to an array of variants, and it's here it's taking, so the array of variants is just one variant for each element of the cluster, and you can pull off the name and that's it, and then you can write it and it'll write it to the file. And this TDMS VI takes care of all the types and everything for you, so you don't have to do any typecasting, which is nice, and that's it. And then for the reading it back, I, I dropped the sub in here again, and it basically does the same thing. It takes your cluster, turns it into an array of variants, pulls the name off, and that's what it reads, and it uses that data type to tell it what data to read, turn back out. And then here you have to do a little magic to get it back to something that will then eventually turn back into the cluster. So this is really the magic secret sauce. The rest of this is pretty straightforward. Um, straightforward if you know what to do, right? You have to figure out that you can do that and it works. But and this VI is in the hidden gems package. So does everybody know about the hidden gems package? So if you don't, go to VI package manager, look up hidden gems and install it. Uh, it's a bunch of stuff that's in VI lib. It's just hidden, it's not exposed on the palette. Somebody at NI, Darren, to be exact, uh, thought it was a great idea to make all that available and put it on the palette so you can go install that. So uh, if you gotta think about installing <coughs> external stuff, you can install that because it's not putting any new code on your thing, it's just adding all that stuff to the palettes. I know some people don't like to install external stuff for like licensing reasons or whatever, but you can install this because you already have it on your computer. All the code's already there, the VI's are VI lib, it's just adding it to the palettes. So don't be afraid of that one. It will make your life a lot easier. There's really, really useful stuff in there, so it's worth going and browsing that. So, oh, the other thing, there was one other point I wanted to make, and that's I have this circle here. So the, the logic to detect the missing keys and the Right, to tell me if there's any keys missing and which ones are missing, I didn't implement that yet. So that's one of the other things with TDD. It prevents you from, how, how many people go off on tangents sometimes and they're like, I'm writing this thing and like, oh, well maybe somebody will want to do this and I'll add this little feature. Or maybe somebody wants to do that and I'll add that little feature. How many times, hey, how many times does that little feature actually end up getting used? Very little. And how many times does it break your code, right? How many times, how often do you find bugs in those features? Because there are these things that you added and you're like, you kind of had this use case in mind, but you didn't really test it because you're like, ah, maybe I'll use that later, right? So it has all these bugs, and then somebody tries to use it and it breaks your code. TDD gets rid of that because you just write what you need to make the test pass. So in this case, my test is just testing the reading and writing. It's not really testing the missing keys stuff yet. I'm gonna add that, but I haven't added it yet. So I don't, so I didn't add any code for that. And my test passed, that's great. I'm done, right? Oh, not quite. So I implemented the main feature, which is, hey, if you write a bunch of data and you read it back and you use the same cluster, everything works, right? But I didn't check for any error cases. I didn't do any other kind of tests. I didn't check to make sure that the, if there's a missing key that it detects it. So I went ahead and I wrote tests for all those things. And I ended up with, for this library, it's got two API VIs and there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 13. 
probably like 30 tests, right? So you might say, Sam, gee, that sounds like a lot of tests, right? You just wrote 30 BIs to test two BIs, right? And you would be right, except that they're actually not that hard to write. Because you write one, and guess what? The other one looks exactly like it, except some of the inputs are changed. So all you do is copy it, rename it, and change the inputs, and change your expected output, and you're done. So in reality, I probably wrote like three or four BIs and copied them 10 times. So uh, here's a test, just as an example of some of the tests that I have. In this case, so I have this naming convention. So uh, JKIBI tests are all your tests have to start with tests. So that's where the test comes from. And then I generally write what I'm testing, so the VI I'm testing, what my inputs are, and what I expect as the output. So in this particular case, it says test failed key. Right, I don't know if you guys can read that. That's kind of blurry for me. So it says, Test, read key, read, so testing the read, so this is a read, and it says key doesn't exist. So a key that doesn't exist, and if the key doesn't exist, and I'm writing it at the channel level, so that's the next thing, and it says returns missing true. Right, so this is a Boolean output that tells you if a key is missing, and so I have, uh, I'm creating a TDMS file. This is just adding a default group and channel, because if I try to write a key to a channel that doesn't exist, I think there is an error, so I need a channel to so this. So I'm creating a TMS file, I'm writing a blank channel, uh, channel group, group to it. And then I've got a key that doesn't exist. I'm trying to read it. I haven't written any keys to it. And I should output true. Now, this read BI should also output the, the name of the missing key. But I'm not checking it here. Why? Do I like writing test BIs? <coughs> Partially. Now, uh, yes, you write an extra BI. But now when it fails, one of the two BIs will fail, and you'll know which one fails immediately. If you test them both at the same time, OK, great. It didn't detect the missing key, but it, did it detect that detector, or did you get the name wrong? I don't know. Right? So if I check them each separately, then I know, hey, oh, it got the name wrong, or hey, it didn't detect it at all. Does that kind of make sense? And to write that other test, it's really freaking simple. I copy this, and instead of checking the Boolean output, I check the name of the key that's out, and I check it against the name of the key that I wrote. Right? So. Writing the other task is as simple as copy, saving this as a new name. Right? And save a copy as a new name, put it in, change a few things, and you're done. If you got three or four outputs, okay, you gotta do that three or four times. But the value that you gain, right, in not wasting a bunch of time debugging and trying to figure out what's wrong, you know instantly. And also it lets you develop things iteratively. So when I developed this, I wrote the check to check that anything was missing first, and I verified to make sure that that worked, and then I wrote the check to check to pull off the individual names. So how many people think this seems like more work? It, more work. <laughs> correct. But do you see where it can save you time in the end? Right? In, in debugging and troubleshooting and right? Because how many times when you're writing something, you write, you think you got it down, <coughs> you get to the end, and hopefully you test it, right? And then you test and you're like, oh wait, that doesn't work. And then you gotta spend all this time debugging and tracing wires and putting probes to figure out where the problem is. Here, if there's a problem, you find it instantly. All right, so uh, test stream design doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? So it's not, you're, you're doing this as part of like a larger process. In this case, uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with continuous integration. I kind of had this grand plan that was going to do this whole continuous integration thing where every time I checked in my code, it would run a bunch of tests. And then on certain, when I was ready to build it, I would check it in and it would automatically build it for me and do all this stuff. And these were all the steps I had in mind. And in the end, it just seemed to be a lot of work for a little library. Yeah, and it's one of those things where if I had a tool set up to automatically do this already and I'd written all the code and I just had to copy and paste it and change a few variables, it would, I would totally do it. But at the point that I was at, I didn't have it all ready, so I didn't do that. But I did do one little thing that I thought was quite useful. Uh, there's a VI for VI tester that will let you programmatically run a test suite. And so I went, when, I, when I did my build in VIPM, and you can do this if you're building an executable. So I was building a, a VI package so that I could distribute it and let other people install. But even if you're building an executable in LabVIEW, right, there's a pre-built VI, you may ever use that? So there's a pre-built VI, so that when you run the build spec before it builds your VI, you can do stuff. So you can set properties on VIs, like make dialogues modal and do stuff. You can do things like run your unit tests. So now nobody's gonna build this project unit tests don't pass because 
Before it builds it, it runs a unit test, and if the unit test don't pass, it generates an error and says, hey, you gotta go check your unit test and make sure they pass. So, uh, it's pre-built VI, you just drop it in there, and then this is, there's a JKI palette that says run unit test, and you pass the unit test you're gonna run, and it'll run. So that's, I call it like poor man's continuous integration. Right? You have to set up a server, you don't have to do anything, but you're kind of automating things a little bit just so that you know, you're never gonna ship something and the customer says, hey, this thing doesn't work, and then you're running your test, and you're like, yep, sure, it doesn't work, right? Because huh. that's kind of embarrassing. Right? At least if, if it doesn't work, it's because, hey, maybe we missed something in our test. It's not, well, we, gee, if we were to run the test, we would have seen that and we would have fixed it, right? So, so it saves you a little egg on your face. At least you have something to show them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Interested. Oh, well, the other great use for unit tests, you were talking about doing stuff for hardware. So how many times do you write stuff for hardware and they, they give you the spec, but the thing isn't built yet? Did they do that, right? Okay, how many times when they build it does it do exactly what the spec says? So it was zero. Right. <laughs> but if you have the original spec, and, you, and, and who, well, actually, here's the next question. Who do they blame when it doesn't work? They, do they blame the hardware or do they blame you? Oh, they would blame you. Correct. And so here's the deal. You take your spec, you write your driver, like the way I showed you over there, mm -hmm. and you write unit tests for everything, like tons of them. And, and it might take longer, but trust me, it's worth it, because then when the hardware comes in, the hardware and, it, and the hardware doesn't work, yeah, that's the other reason, you got time, right? But the hardware doesn't, it doesn't work, right? And they say, no, 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 it's you. You say, hey, look, here's your spec. Here's my test that proves that all my stuff does exactly what your spec says. So you go figure out, you troubleshoot, and you tell me either, you know, you figure out what's wrong, and you decide if you want to go rev your hardware or if I need to rev my software. But you don't have to spend any time troubleshooting. Does that sound like a big win? It sounds like it saved me a heck of a lot of time. They're not going to believe it anyways. I'm still going to have to go down to the lab and work with them. All right, well. I mean, you're right, I can show them all of that and they'll be like, well, that still doesn't work here. And it's just like, okay, let's go test it. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's where you put like uh, some sort of like probe on the wire and you're like, hey, this is exactly what's going across the wire. Well, they got really mad at me when I did it, but I proved it quite conclusively that it was their hardware. Because they do make stuff that you can, that you can like uh, probe serial wires. I know they make like very fancy oscilloscopes that you can clip on and it'll actually decode everything for you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's probably some cheap ones too. Uh, there's none of them are cheap that I've got. Like a couple hundred bucks? Because yeah. uh, the oscilloscopes to do it are like really freaking expensive. Uh, but there's the like logic analyzers. To do it with, uh, these tools plug in with serial ones. So okay. if you want to learn about it, that, I, this one wasn't a serial that I'm thinking back when I was there at 7 oh. o'clock on a Saturday because they called me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. See, yeah, it never happens at a convenient time. So, and everything's always running late and there's all this pressure. And but yeah, so that, that is an awesome use of unit testing. So, and that's one, you do that once, and I think you can justify that to like everybody in the front. Right. Hey, look, it saved us all this I time. I mean, I have built a tester, so this was for a motor driver, yeah. and basically I had to send out an enable bit, a direction bit, yeah. and then a pulse line yeah. that I would ramp up. And I actually just took another c Rio with a digital input card yeah. and set that up to test and show that everything was passing. And they're like, no, we still think it's your software. <laughs> but the other nice thing, though, too, is if you write the unit test, you can actually help them out and kind of be their hero, too, because say, okay, say go back to a serial driver, right, there's like 10 different commands. Well, your unit test, right, if you know, like, which command's not passing, you know, boom, here, you know, you can hand it to them. Especially if it's, like, the data coming back in, right, so if you're saying, hey, this is the data that should be coming back in, then, you know, you can, you can kind of help them through one thing a little bit. All right, so some of the benefits of test driven design, right? better API design, right? So you gotta design your API up front, you become the first person to use it, and all those decisions about, well, what's the best way to pass this value in or out, do I use it through a cluster, do I do individual things, right? You're playing around with it, so you're gonna figure it out. And you're gonna figure it out before you release it to somebody, right? Because once you release an API to somebody, and they're using it, if you change it, it breaks their code, they don't like that, right? So if you write your test, and as you write your test, you keep changing your API, that's fine, because the only stuff you're breaking is your own. Um, you're gonna put testable code. Not only do you know it's testable, you can prove it because you wrote the tests. Uh, it's cleaner, because you're not writing a bunch of acts for code, and hopefully you take that step to do the refactoring and the, like, the garbage cleanup. Uh, you catch bugs really early, and to me it gives me extreme clarity, because I know exactly what I'm doing, because I've written the test first, it makes me think ahead that little bit. Um, so it is a small investment, right? Notice I didn't say expense, it's an 
investment, right? Because it pays you back later. Um, you know, you think it's a lot of work, but copying the test actually makes writing them pretty dang quick. It's not too bad. And if your tests are really simple, that also helps, right? If you're writing these big complex tests, stop, reevaluate what you're doing. If you can't figure it out, call me up and I'll come help you. But that's not the way to do it. Um, it's about going slow to go fast, right? It's about being very slow and methodical versus like I'm gonna charge ahead full speed and just throw myself at it and see what happens. That very rarely ends well. You get somewhere quick, but it's never where you want to go. Um, uh, debugging tests does suck. If it fails and you're like, oh, I can't figure out if it's a test or a suck, that's bad. So that's why I say keep it simple, right, for the tests. Um, CI is really nice, and if you have a system set up for it, it's really great. Again, for those of you who don't know, basically it's like you have the server sitting there, and when you check stuff into your GitLab or uh, SVN or whatever you're doing, it notices you check something in and then it does some automatic action for you, like running tests or building stuff, or maybe if everything's ready to go, it could like, build it and send it off to your customers. So it takes a lot of those manual steps out. But it doesn't always add value. So you know, if you've got, th this is like a tiny project that I did and once I got it working, like I'm not gonna change it, right? Unless they change the TMS spec, which is probably not gonna happen. But for like, you know, if you're part of a, still doing some product, right, and they're intending on revving the product and adding features to it, right, then that CI stuff becomes more important because you're gonna keep revving your software. You know you're gonna keep revving it. All right, um, so getting started with unit testing. So this one's huge, and I just wrote a blog post about this. I don't know, I don't remember if it actually posted yet or not. Um, don't ask permission. So if somebody gives you a BI, and it's, everybody knows the classic LabVIEW state machine, right? You've got the enum and the shift register, and you've got the case structure. Somebody hands you one, like, well, you just want to unit this tiny little change, right? And we're all laughing because we know it's never a tiny little change. And you open up the thing and you open up the enum and it's got like 20 states in it, right? Enough that you can't keep it all straight in your head. What's the first thing you do? How many people sit down with a piece of paper, a pen or a whiteboard and draw up a state diagram and say, all right, start and initialize and then go through the case and be like, okay, at the end of initialize, we go to this state. How many people do that? Anybody? How many people would ask their boss permission to go do that? Say, hey boss, I wanna go draw up this diagram and document it. Nobody would, right? Because you're like, this is part of the job. I'm supposed to understand this, right? So if we view unit testing as part of writing good software is making sure it works, right? Because your boss, I'm sure, wants the software that you write to actually work. And nobody, nobody, no boss says, hey, write me a bunch of software and just hope it works, right? They're upset when it doesn't work, right? It's egg on their face just like yours. Right? So don't ask permission, just do it. And just, if your boss says anything, say, hey, that's part of the job. You know, your job is to manage, my job is to write software. Writing software involves writing tests to make sure it works. Managing your manager is a useful skill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so that's part of it. Uh, two, if you're just getting started, try and start in a fresh project. Um, sometimes it works, like if, you're, if you have a project and you're adding a feature, okay, you can write some tests for the new VIs that you're writing and that kind of works. But you still don't have the test, you know, that you don't break other things and so it's still kind of awkward and messy, it can work. Um, another thing too is if you find a bug, right? If they report a bug in your software and you run it and your unit test suite doesn't catch it, what do you think the first thing you should do is? Write the test to find the bug, right? And run it and make sure it, it fails because then you know it does catch the bug. And then go fix it. And now you've got a unit test. And you're, even if you're, none of the code you have has a unit test, now you have one unit test. And then you find another bug and write another unit test. And so you can start building up. It doesn't have to be this like all or nothing. Right? Unfortunately though, like the real power of test driven development, the real power of unit testing is when you have tests for everything. The problem is it takes a lot to get to that point and, and people never get there. But once you get there and you see that, you will not want to go back. So write the test first, right? And don't forget the refactoring stuff, because otherwise all those little messy things kind of just add up and it just turns into clutter. It's like, you know, you leave one or two things lay on the kitchen table or one or two dishes in the sink, eh, not a big deal, right? But then it encourages you to leave more dishes in the sink and next thing you know, the dishes are overflowing and your wife's screaming at you and it's a big mess, right? It starts to stink, whatever. Hopefully you don't let it get that far. Um, I have a whole series of articles on unit testing. It talks all about this. It also talks about the stuff I talked about over there with the uh, iSerial and all that stuff. 
And there is a unit testing group of the NI forums. So that's a useful place to go for more information. Um, okay. Uh, you guys can go to this if you want. This is for the mastermind group. I thought I took this out of here. Um, but if you guys sign up for that, uh, you can sign up for that. Um, and that's it. So hopefully that was useful. How did I go on timing? I really wasn't paying attention. Great. Okay. It worked out great. Yeah, that's even more useful than the test. I'll probably delete that. Just uh, same one question. Yes. So, when you turn the test code, unit test code, into production code, is there any concern of consideration? You know, you know can you make the unit test code closer to the production code? So, when you make the changes, you do. So, so, you're saying, let me make sure I understand your question. You're asking, when I take the code, so I've got code and I've got unit tests. When I release this code, what do I do with the unit tests? I mean, <clears throat> what well, you're going to do right at production code, right? Yeah, so the tests are not part of the production code, they are a separate thing. There are some ways if you do like a, a source distribution or you build a PPL, you can take the same tests and relink them to link them to the PPL and test the PPL. So that's a really cool, powerful feature. Right, because PPLs are these things you build it's binary and you can't really debug it or anything. But if you have unit tests written for the original library before you focus on the PPL, you can relink those and then you can test your PPL. So that's super huge and powerful. So if something got screwed up in your build process, something didn't link correctly, you can catch it with your unit test. So that's pretty cool. If anyone wants to do that, just let me know. I can show you how to do that. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. What happens? talked about everything encapsulating that lower level DI. How hard is it when you start going to the upper level DIs that call that lower level DI? Uh, hold on. So, so you're talking. So now I've got everything in driver encapsulated. All right. So, you, so you've got your driver. Now I've got my upper level. Okay. That's testing your driver. You can um, do the same thing. Actually, you can wrap. You can create an interface for your driver, and you can have a separate class that just mimics your driver. Okay. So you can inject commands all the way down here at the serial level, and have them filter up. Mm -hmm. But really, just inject them at the driver level, right? Because you've already tested that the, the, the everything bubbles up from the serial through the driver. You don't need all that. And it also clutters your tests, right? Because if you're testing at a higher level, you don't really need to see serial level implementation. You can see the driver level. <coughs> so, hey, you know. <coughs> I want the driver to respond with an output of 10 volts. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, I want, it, I want the serial output to be this thing, a string that then translates into 10 volts and bubbles up through. Does that kind of make sense? It does. The only so thing so you I'm just do this abstraction at every level. I'm just worried about scaling. So like, let's say I've got one overarching VI and it's got five sub VIs mm -hmm. that it's got below, let's just say five drivers. Yeah. Now I've unit tested each of those five drivers, so now they're good. But now, if I go to my upper level VI and it calls each of those drivers, now I have to make wrappers for every single one of those drivers. Yeah, yep. And it's just so something just, we have to live with. Yeah, you just, yeah, I mean, so you can also be strategic about what you unit test, right? So yeah. maybe at some point, you get to a high enough level that you're like, we're not going to unit test this. We're going to do this in our factory acceptance test. Okay. Right? Because like maybe the upper level is really just as simple as take these drivers, read some values, and display it on the GUI, right? You don't really need to write a unit test to take a value and write it to a numeric indicator, right? Well, usually at that upper level, they're taking information from the drivers and then making a decision based off of it. And usually where I have my problems are when something gets bad information from a driver 
and then tries to make a decision off of it, and what does it do in that case? So yeah, but then you sense. can inject the bad information and see what it does. Yeah. Right? Make sure it does what you think it should do. Right, and that would go into the, when you're checking all, all the different paths, right? That, that's like the error path or like the bad path, mm -hmm. the path of like bad corrupt data. Which is a really important thing to test for because things don't always produce what you think they're gonna produce, right? If it's possible for it to produce a negative number, yeah, if it's a double and it could be a negative number, even if it's always supposed to be positive, test it with a negative number and see what happens. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. Sorry, I'm not trying to pick up your time. I'll take a few minutes to get stuff. All right, so that's good because I'm going to go grab some food. Yeah, take your time. Is that thing still going? Yes, it's still going. Awesome. I'm upset that I missed recording in the beginning, but that's